Hello Nippies! Welcome back to the channel and if you're new here, hi, hello, I'm Nips, a freelance artist. And today we're going to be working on the other postcard that I mentioned in an old postcard video, uh, a recent one actually, of that one that just flashed on the screen. So I'll put it in the top right or in the bottom description if you guys are interested in checking it out. So today we're going to be working on a postcard of an original character of a very good friend of the channel, uh, Man and Moon Art, owned by Amanda LaPalm. And if you recognize that name, they are a Yu-Gi-Oh content creator. They create all sorts of Yu-Gi-Oh accessories, mats, deck boxes, card backs, tokens, sleeves, dice, everything you can imagine, the highest of qualities. I'm gonna put their store down below if you guys are interested in checking it out. It is absolutely amazing. I, I copped some of the, the stuff from them as well. I'll put some of the pictures that I took up on screen if you guys are interested in seeing a little preview of what it looks like. Totally, totally recommend. And the other thing I recommend is the webcomic that Amanda is creating and it's called Raising Hell, another link that I'll put down below if you guys are interested. And it is just so cute. It's basically a little girl that is being raised by demon daddy overlord. And he is just being converted into being the most, oh my Lord, the most cutest father of all time, <laughs> raising a child that is developing powers and becoming kind of a problem. And so, and thus the pun is born, raising hell. So super adorable. And I was very kindly commissioned by Amanda to do a postcard of any one of our characters. And I just had to choose this character in the bottom uh, bottom left that um, that reference was drawn by Amanda. And oh my God, I just absolutely love this character. The personality, the design, the color scheme, just everything about her is ooh, iconic. And so I decided to go with this character a little bit earlier in the video, you saw me, usually I start with the thumbnails, um, try to get an idea of the composition of the piece. I go ahead and then I trace the size of the postcard onto a blank white regular printer paper. And then I'll go ahead and do the full size sketch there. So that way I don't mess up the actual postcard that is going to be in watercolor paper. Usually I have a combination of cold press and hot press paper. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I don't really super have a, have a preference, but the cold press paper has a little bit more texture. Hopefully I'm not mixing those up, but I do like the one with a little bit more texture because it tends to hold more layers better. Um, but the hot pressed one is just so flat and smooth. So sometimes it's really what I'm feeling at the time. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll use a light box in order to transfer the messy sketch onto the actual paper. And that way I have already a refined sketch on there. And the problem, if you saw, if you paid attention, you might have to go back, um, is that I don't have a light box on me. And essentially what it is, it just allows you to trace. And so I used the backlight of my phone and it was so chaotic. So <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll get a light box in the future to avoid that. But either way, still successful. It did what it needed to do. It would be better if it was an actual light box because with this method, I can only copy so much because I have no stability. I have to angle the light in certain ways. So hopefully I'll get an actual light box that will make the process that much easier. As we're watching this part of the video, you'll see that I have my little VTuber on the side. And so this was done on stream. So I do apologize in advance for the lighting. My editor, Justin, lovely editor, tried to help the best that they could with some of the color grading and the lighting for this video in post. So God bless them. I will put their link down below if you guys are looking for an amazing editor, uh, hardworking, always on time, amazing. Thank you so much, Justin. So yeah, and so once I have the pencils, um, I usually go 
start with color pencil, colored lead first. I usually also put all of my materials down below in the Amazon, uh, in an Amazon wish list link if you guys are interested in seeing. And if you do purchase from that list for yourself, uh, I do get a little portion. So help support me if you guys want. Um, but yeah, check it out. All the materials that I use exactly are there. And so, yeah, so going back to the sketch, I start off with the colored lead, um, very light. Sometimes it adds a really nice layer to the watercolor. I sometimes leave it a little bit. I don't erase it completely. Um, and then I go over and pencil with more detail. And I use the netted eraser in order to kind of, um, you'll see that that's like the, the gooey eraser there in order to not ruin the paper, but lighten up the lines of the pencil and then go over with e a micron, a micron. Yes. A micron. I was trying to remember what pen I was using. Yeah. The micron pen, um, usually an 003 and the smaller, the better for me. That's not what she said, right? <laughs> the smaller the tip of the pen the better i just love adding so many details and so i'm a huge fan of the really small tipped uh pencils pens etc and um you'll see that i haven't gotten there yet but once i do this stage i usually have to go back and forth between the lines and the pencils because sometimes once i do certain lines i kind of realize that I need to go into more detail for other parts of the pieces. I definitely had to do that with a lot of her clothes and her face because I really, really did not want to ruin her face. I felt like there was something in her look, like the way that she looks at you, that is just so important. And her face was really just, aside from the amazing like outfit and colors and color scheme and everything of the piece, I felt like the way she was staring at you was a huge part of the piece and so i needed to make sure that that was flawless well as flawless as i could get it truly but yeah and so you'll see that i'll, I'll go back several times with pencil to make sure that it is correct and you'll also see later in the piece that i think i mentioned it also in my last postcard video but i do kind of have quite a big blunder in this piece where I smudge a giant piece of black ink across the side and I have to go in with gouache. So normally when I do these, I absolutely love watercolors and the PH Martin's inks. And those are, I, those are in the, in the Amazon link. If you guys are curious exactly which brands I use, but I absolutely love those. Watercolor is like my, f if, if I had to pick one, watercolor is my favorite traditional medium. And I've always wanted to get into gouache and really start using it. And at least primarily because I do use gouache, but usually only if I have to go on top of the watercolor and fix something, or I want to make something a little bit more opaque. Is opaque the right word? Like I want to make it a little bit more saturated i guess i'm not sure not in color but just in like pigment like more pigmented i guess is the word um but i've never actually just really created a final piece in entirely gouache um i do have some sketch practices that i did a long time ago but i don't really count those because they're kind of just like in my sketchbook really and um not really like as a commission or a, a final like illustrative piece so i really want to get back into more traditional mediums and maybe learning how to use gouache finally um so i'm, I'm really excited and i had to really pull out the the big guns trying to fix this piece uh, using the gouache so it'll be exciting for you guys to see it um yeah, so here you guys probably saw this in my previous video as well, but I absolutely, at least for me, I am not skilled um, with winging color off the top. I absolutely need to have an idea of where the colors and the palettes, the shades, the tones, everything is going 
um, so that when I sit down to work traditionally, I know exactly what I'm doing. And so what I'll do is you'll see that here, I basically took a picture of the finished line art and I imported it into my iPad on Procreate. And it's very simple. I absolutely love Procreate. Those of you that have an iPad, I'm not sure what programs you use or somebody that is interested in getting an iPad, cannot recommend Procreate enough. That program is just absolutely God tier for the price. The amount of things that are available to you on that program is just astronomical and it just keeps improving. Honestly, not sponsored, but should be because I will shill for this program. Oh my goodness, endlessly. And yeah, so you'll see me here doing a color sample. I usually just call it like a color sample or a color draft and basically set the top layer to multiply um, the, the picture layer. And then I'll just do a base and really messily just kind of fill in the colors, trying to get an idea of where things will be, in what tone. The shadows are usually, like the shadows and the light source are usually the most important thing for me. I really need to see where things are going to be because everything else sometimes can be winged for me, but at least the light source and the shadows, I think, um, especially the general like tone of the picture, like the mood, um, is it going to be a more warm picture? Is it going to be a colder picture? All of those things I think are super helpful, at least for me to kind of plan in advance. And those of you that are maybe like, I mean, even if you're super experienced with traditional mediums, maybe, maybe you'll find it useful to, if you have some digital media. Uh, available to you. Oh my goodness. It's so good because especially digitally where you can just lasso tool or just pick a layer and just kind of, you know, color slider the, um, the, um, the tones and just kind of like fall into a color that you might like is so useful because if you're color sampling traditionally, you know, you have to essentially like start over. Like if you don't like the color, okay, let me do another thumbnail. But with digital, it's just so easy. The tools that we have access to is, oh, makes everything so much faster. And so now that I'm finally starting on the coloring process, pulling out all my materials here, getting the PH Martins, getting the getting the watercolors is seeing me there I'm doing some some little blunders but um this tool here that i have is the masking fluid and when i tell you that this tool changed my traditional game significantly um and i got this from an artist that you should definitely check out as well hey kala there's no way you haven't heard of them. They are just so good. Their traditional pieces are beautiful. And I had never seen this material before. And I was like, oh my goodness, how did I not know? And it's just so fun because every day you learn new things, no matter how much and how long you've spent doing art. And so what this is, is it's essentially liquid latex. I, I explain this, I feel like every single time that I start a new piece, but it's liquid latex. You put it in the areas that you don't want the paint to go in. You let it dry and you essentially just paint over it. And it's super easy, very easy way to not go out of the lines. And you're gonna say, well, why don't you just not go out of the lines? But I will say if you're working, especially in, in watercolor, and you want to do like a very smooth, like gradient, it's so much easier to just cover the areas that you don't want to paint over. And in watercolor, I'm sure there are many, many different methods, but the method that I use to do gradient is you do the liquid latex, um, leave the, the area that you want to gradient, gradient open, and what you'll do is you'll clean your brush as much as you can. And um, you go ahead and you put a layer of water on, on the entire area that you're going to gradient. And you don't have to put too much. I mean, you can play around with the quantity of the water depending on the style that you wanna get. Do you want it to be slightly splotchy? Do you want it to be extremely, extremely clean and smooth? You can play with it once you get the hang of it. But by filling the whole layer with water, you essentially kind of create this more malleable area where you can move the watercolor uh, around to get it as smooth as possible without it 
essentially like without the paper eating it and so once the paper eats it like you you now have to it's almost like unblendable um because watercolor you can layer and that's what i love about watercolor is that you can just layer once it dries you add something it's like your watercolor is kind of like everything is on the the multiply layer and that's what i love about it is you could just keep adding to it you're like oh now i want this to be a little more purple and then you add this purple wash on top and all of a sudden you have this beautiful purple tint and that's like essentially my favorite thing about watercolor is you could just keep going <laughs> not that you can't with gouache but i feel like something with gouache and oil and acrylic it's like slightly harder though acrylic is like an in-between bit of gouache and watercolor so that one is a little bit different um yeah and then once you put the whole layer of water then you can essentially start adding the the gradient colors and then even add more water if you need to and it just looks so incredibly smooth um and then once you're done you let everything dry and you can go in with your finger or usually the back of a paintbrush some paintbrushes have like a flat back um so you can use that to kind of like scrape off the 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 liquid latex now the issue that i ran into is that if you use your fingers you got to make sure and you'll see there on the right that i used my finger and your fingers have oil on them your skin has oil on it and so if you do use that you got to make sure that you're kind of careful about your hands and how oily they are and whether that's going to affect the pigment that you're like rubbing over and so i definitely learned my lesson and a lot of the times it's not that i didn't even know it's like oh it's gonna be fine it's gonna be fine and then i did it and it wasn't fine and so here i am using gouache in order to paint over that because if you do it in watercolor like i said it's like you're painting in multiply and you're essentially there's no way to to really hide that black unless you're going to go darker or you're kind of going to blend it in with some darker colors um and now that i use these colors here you could probably i could have probably gotten away with using maybe some watercolor and stuff but i didn't want to risk it paint the whole thing and then be like oh you can still see it and now i have to go over it with gouache and just adding constant layers to the watercolor paper even though this is really good watercolor paper i don't want to risk um kind of tearing tearing the surface or you know adding too many layers so i was like let me just go in directly in gouache and the gouache that I'm using is the Arteza. Um, I had a sponsored video with them a long time ago and I've always held on to these gouache paints because like I said, I've always wanted to uh, learn how to use gouache and they're the only ones that I have. And those of you that actually use gouache are probably, oh my gosh, side-eyeing me right now. Like, how are you using those? Because I know they're not known to be the best quality i know they're a much better quality gouache but i will say they do get the job done maybe when i try other brands of gouache um maybe i'll change my mind but arteza is is a brand that you essentially know what you're getting um it's not the most expensive or high quality brand but it does exactly what i need it to do and so i've been pretty happy using them in the meantime since i'm not doing full paintings in gouache but if you do use gouache and uh you have any recommendations for brands and stuff um even watercolors as well feel free to leave them down in the comments below i'm super interested um but yeah so here we are moving along to the umbrella and you'll also see i didn't mention but i have these uh glittery kind of paints that i used and teal is one of my favorite colors and so i of course i have a glittery teal paint and had to add it to the eye because like i said the face is the main focus of this piece and so i really wanted your eyes to be drawn to the center of the face and so i really wanted to add this kind of like glittery thing of to the energy kind of coming out of her eyes and i got kind of carried away and i ended up add adding it to the bottom left as well because we have kind of like the mist the foreground mist and then we also have like the background one and so it ended up 
looking really nice because you I got to distinguish the foreground from the background with kind of the the glittery accents so you know sometimes you just wing it and it works out um but yeah here we're coming to the umbrella adding the washes like we did before on the background and here here we come into an issue where i've mentioned it multiple times before and it happens to me not just in digital but it happens to me in traditional all the time especially i would say honestly more traditional than digital because when i do traditional pieces i i tend to kind of go overboard with the lines i absolutely just love line art i don't know if there's anybody out there i know line art gets memed for people just finding it super tedious and not liking it but i absolutely love the line art process because to me just getting a picture and adding all the details and making it come to life and then getting the lines as clean as possible and then adding colors to clean lines is like the most cathartic feeling in the world to me so it's amazing i don't know is there anybody out there the one percent that really enjoys line art call yourself out let yourself be known in the comments down below um but yeah and so um we are wait what was i oh we're doing oh oh so where i was going with that see getting derailed by loving line art okay so where i was going with that is that um you'll see that the umbrella is mostly just black and different values of black and one of the issues that i have with traditional that i was mentioning is where this whole conversation started was that i have a problem with overshadowing like my lines so i spend all this time working on the line art adding all the details making sure everything just looks you know super alive the weight of the lines everything and then once i start going into colors i kind of like ruin the lines by covering them or kind of not choosing the correct colors and just like a mixture of a lot of things and I tend to have that issue more traditionally because one, you can't kind of like, at least in the mediums that I work in, I can't really go back and kind of like, you know, like slider, you know, add a filter on top to, to lighten the colors. And so once I set a color, you know, or once I do something like it's kind of done and sometimes certain colors kind of overshadow the lines and so i like to usually work much lighter than i want which is much easier to do in watercolor like i said because essentially you can create this very very light wash you'll see that i'm doing that on her skin essentially here just very very light so you can kind of get an idea of what the color is actually supposed to be but you can still see and appreciate the lines and that's essentially what i did on the umbrella and you'll see me doing this for her hair here as well and i started mentioning it with the umbrella because it happens to me the most with just black and general values of black because one of the things that i absolutely love when it comes to the actual painting process is very very dark gradiented black shadows so you'll see that i have this like uh pot on the side which is in this like skincare pot because when i was moving i couldn't take the whole bottle of um i'm pretty sure it was like sumi ink is what i use in order to do these uh very very dark black shadows because it's the darkest black that i can find um and so I couldn't bring the whole bottle with me. So I took kind of like an empty face cream thing to kind of put it in my travel bag. But yeah, and so when I do those, I don't want to overshadow the lines, but I absolutely love like the pitch black shadows, like gradiented doing this very soft, smooth gradient into like the other extreme. So going from very, very dark to like very, very light in the smoothest gradient possible with a very hard edge, if that makes any sense. And that is like one of my guilty pleasures when I do these. And so 
it's always very difficult to try and get a balance between I don't want to ruin the lines, but I also want to do this very, very dark, intense shadow. And so you'll see me once I start applying shadows here and there, especially like to the back part of the hair. And then once we get into the shadows under the umbrella as well, um, I always start with the lightest possible wash that I can because I get too scared to go too dark too fast because you just can't go back. And so at least in watercolor. And so the umbrella, even though it, it is very like dark black, I start very, very light. And you'll see here, like I really want an intense shadow under her, under the umbrella. And I just start with this very light, like tealish, like off, um, not very saturated teal and i start getting darker and darker as i get more comfortable and i realize okay like maybe maybe it's fine to go slightly darker but i absolutely love like doing these very like i want to say i don't want to say because off black is technically gray right like what is the actual term right but i say off black because the intention is that your eye perceives it as black yeah like it's not the umbrella isn't supposed to be gray but i do it that light because i like to show my lines and so i instead go some values lighter but the eye is supposed to perceive it as black right i'm not sure if i'm ever doing that correctly as a like at least rendering wise, like does your eye still perceive it as black or is your is your brain still reading it as gray? I wonder, I think I'm biased because I'm looking at it and I know it's supposed to be black. So in my mind, I'm perceiving it as black, but <laughs> let me know down below. Um, and maybe, maybe it'll be perceiving it as gray because you can see the preview down in the left. And I put that on the screen just so that I can constantly see what I'm supposed to be aiming towards. And I just absolutely love like the rich, like purple undertone, kind of plumish undertone that the digital preview has. And I don't actually remember, I'm, I'm kind of re reliving this with you guys because I did this a couple weeks ago from what I remember. Um, if I was able to achieve that kind of like rich color traditionally, but um, yeah, sometimes I get really, really sad when I do like these color previews and I can't achieve that color traditionally. And I'm like, oh, because traditionally, like you, you have to just own the color. And if you don't own it, you have to mix it. But there are certain mixtures that you just physically cannot make, like no matter how much you try. And so I talked about this a little bit in the previous postcard video where no matter how much I try, I cannot get this cyan color to look exactly how I want it because I do not have a color that bright, that like fluorescent and neon. And that is a color that you literally cannot mix. As far as I know, no matter how much you try with the colors, I, unless you have something that is on that level of like neon. And so I got really sad because as far as colors go, I absolutely, I'm guilty pleasure. I absolutely love neon colors. Like the, the more saturated everything is, the better. So I sometimes struggle with color theory because I, I know that I shouldn't be putting really saturated colors in certain parts of the piece. And I'm like, but it's fine. It's fine. It looks so cool. <laughs> and some of the things that you'll notice as the piece goes on, um, literally like under the umbrella where I really wanted that super bright, like, like pink red, like, Ooh, th that color just kind of glowing from under the, the umbrella. I really wanted that. And I don't think I really got to achieve it as neon as I wanted to, but here you'll see me start putting those black shadows that I talked about, just going from pure black, just absolutely the darkest black possible and kind of just going into this, this gradient. And I decided as far as I know to not go pure black on the umbrella. I kind of left it because I really loved the details on some strands of her hair um, under the umbrella. So 
I decided not to go too dark there just to kind of appreciate the work that I did on the lines and I started adding some more pure blacks elsewhere just to kind of start leveling out the values and making sure that the values throughout the piece are consistent and satisfying so that the whole piece actually looks like it has the correct lighting and I usually try to leave the pitch black um, shadows for last um, I don't know if this is like a universal truth, but I'm told that you should leave those and the pure whites for last. So here I am trying to be a good art student <laughs> and saving that for last. And so what I decided to do, since there's like kind of like minimal details on her hair, uh, on the shadows under the umbrella, I kind of left it like kind of foggy. I decided to go in onto the frills and add more details and add the pitch black shadows there instead because it started to feel like slightly empty since I didn't go pure black under there. And I was so happy that I did that because you'll see I'm adding like some very, very pure black edges onto the line art there to really bring the umbrella forward and leave her under it. And adding the details on the frills just made it pop out that much more. And it just, it made the subtle kind of light tealish desaturated shadow under her, on top of her head, that much nicer. So, you know, sometimes happy accidents. Um, here you'll see me do an extra wash on the umbrella. I'm kind of happy with the um, darkening of the values in general. And so I decided to just kind of give it an extra wash on top, thinking that maybe it's not going to wash out the lines too much. Decide to go in and add some of those pitch black shadows to the red as well. And this one I was having some trouble with because I felt like the the details on the top, the, the top frills were not as nice as the bottom frills. And once I started adding the black, it just like did not, it didn't like look right. And so I tried to go in with more, a more saturated red and see if I could salvage a bit of the details, make it look a little bit more finished. And speaking of finished, um, I also have to go in usually in the backgrounds or wherever I used the liquid latex, because once you remove the liquid latex, I'm, I'm not super experienced in using it. I don't do primarily, I, I, I love painting traditionally and I have painted traditionally many times, but I don't paint enough where I can consider my skills as a traditional artist enough to, <laughs> give solid advice because I don't do it often enough, but, uh, so I don't know if I'm applying the liquid latex as properly or efficiently as I can be because sometimes I'll remove the liquid latex. And even though I applied it to the exact areas that I do not want paint on, sometimes when I peel it off, it won't be exact. So then I'll have to go back and kind of clean up the edges. Um, I don't know if that's like because it leaks, it like bleeds on the paper, or if my brush is just like too damaged. I'm not sure what it is, but that might be a step that you'll have to do depending on how you apply it. Not sure if that's like a, a skill issue that I have to maybe get better at, but you'll see me here doing the final touches. Like I said, pure blacks, pure whites last. And I just absolutely love doing like the highlights. Well, I haven't done her eyes yet. I feel like I'm just leaving them because that's like the finishing, like the the truly like finishing touch. But yeah, for the white, for the white accents, I do use the deleter. I use this white paint, the deleter paint. And I use that one because it's just literally pure, absolutely like the purest white that I have found. And it's just, it dries super fast it goes, the pigment is incredible. Like it will go over and cover literally anything, literally deletes it. And so I, I remember I bought it once at a manga store, um, just to try it. And I fell in love with it and I will not use any other brand to do my white accents. And so I have the pitch black Sumi ink for the very, very dark spots and my white deleter for the accents and highlights and just amazing. 
Here we're going back in with some very, very saturated finishing touch layers and finally going into the eyes and adding that final, ooh, that final stare that is going to bring this piece to a completion. And I'm just so happy with how this painting came out. Um, I like rarely do traditional nowadays and I just like always forget how there's just something about having a traditional medium right in front of you and just sitting down and hammering out hours of just paint and being able to touch your painting is something that I find irreplaceable. And so I just absolutely, I'm so proud of this piece and hopefully in the future, let me know if you guys want to see more traditional pieces. I just, oof, I just love this sort of thing. So let me know what you guys thought about this video in the comments down below. Like it if you liked it, subscribe, join the Nippy family, the more the merrier. And of course, check out Raising Hell the comic, check out Man and Moon. I'll put all their links down below. And yeah, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys next video. Bye!